The Natural Selection. Hello and welcome. You are listening to The Natural Selection podcast. I am Lizzie. And I'm Rebecca. The focus on renewable energy is only increasing in our world today as we see greener ways to support our ever-growing energy demand. Wind farms have recently been hailed as one of the cheapest renewable energies. However, a recent study shows that their impact on marine predatory birds, such as the northern gannet, are greater than previously estimated. We're lucky today because Ian Cleesby has agreed to talk to us about his research into northern gannets at Bass Rock in Scotland. They use 3D tracking of these birds to look at their flight height and vulnerability. Hi Ian. Hello. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How about you guys? Yeah, good, yes, yeah, very good, thank you. Okay, so I want to jump straight into it by highlighting the Catch-22 around your research. Wind farms are considered one of the most efficient forms of renewable energy, but actually the effects of wind farms in your research are a lot more detrimental than previously thought. Could you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, so we were looking at the flight heights of gannets, and I guess our take-home conclusion was that they fly higher than we thought, and so therefore they're more at risk of colliding. So that's kind of a negative, but I think there's, a, there's, a, there's kind of a balance here. There's things we can do to reduce the impact upon gannets, for example, changing wind turbine design and stuff. So it's, it's not the end of the world. It's just an extra consideration that we think should be taken into account when you're building a wind farm. I, think. I, I don't want to come out. When we did this, it was kind of, it wasn't meant to be pro or anti wind farm. Okay. So there's, there's no kind of agenda to be one or the other. Why are these findings so important? I mean, what do they mean for the northern gannet? And why is the northern gannet particularly important to the UK? Um, so I think the gannet's kind of important to the UK just because we're, we're the home to the majority of the population, at least during the breeding season. So depending on the figures, we probably have about 68% of the world's breeding population wow. uh, around the UK and, and I Ireland. I didn't know that. Wow. And maybe even 85% at EU level. So. I always think of the UK as kind of the, the home of the gannet, and so although the gannet's not in any sense a threatened species in terms of numbers, in fact they're growing. Anything that we, any effects that we have here in our country is important for the, popu- the global population as a whole. So that's why I think gannets are important. They've also been one of the species that's thought to be more at risk at these wind farms because we kind of know that they fly occasionally at these sort of dangerous heights above 20 meters, and there's there's even suggestions that they're not the most renew- uh, maneuverable of birds. And again, there is some, some studies that have found gannets that have, have died and uh, they have injuries consistent with hitting blades. So they, they seem to be an at-risk species. And I guess the second part of the question was just the importance of the findings. And I guess it's mainly because we now think that they fly higher than we previously thought that just puts them slightly more at risk from flying in the swept area of turbine blades. And so again, it's not, I don't want to be too negative on wind farms, but it's just an extra thing to take into account when you go through the process of, um, I don't know, making a proposal about a wind farm and so on. Okay, so according to your study, previous research may have severely underestimated the risk of offshore uh, wind farms on northern gannet populations. Can you explain to our listeners your novel approach to assessing this risk? Yeah, so we were using these sort of standard collision risk models that you use in an ecological impact assessment. And they have lots of sort of more standard things in them, like you need to know the density of birds in, in the area, you need to say things about the size of the turbines, etc. And the only thing we really changed was we put in estimates of flight height based on bird-based altimeters and compared them with the old techniques of estimating flight heights from ship-based surveys. Okay. So at present, most people estimate the height of birds by basically sending people out on, on boats at sea and you see a, a bird with your binoculars and you have to estimate by eye its height, which is quite a tricky thing to do even when people are trained, but it's still quite subjective. Yeah. And at sea there's no, there's no landmarks to help you like a tree or a building. And so our technique was to actually fit altimeters onto the birds that would sort of, they basically measure air pressure and you, you can basically get the altitude using this parametric equation, which is basically <laughs> you just have the air pressure measured from the birds in flight compared to a reference sea level pressure. And it's the difference between those two pressures that gives you an estimate of altitude. And uh, we combined it with fitting their GPSs. So not only did we have the altitude, but we knew where they were flying at what altitudes. So it's a lot more precise method than previous research. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, it's kind of novel, but I mean, so there have been studies on um, one came out in 2014, kind of maybe a year, six months before us, that had done it in gannets in Canada. So people have, have started to use these altimeters more in birds now. So I think it'll, it'll grow and grow, and the technique we use to get the um, estimates could be refined in the future as well. So I hope it'll just get better and better, and we'll get more and more precise estimates of height. Something that I found particularly interesting was that um, your study showed that the flight height changes with behaviour as well. So would you like to tell our listeners a bit about that? 
Yeah, so it's quite cool because we have the GPS locations with the heights that you can't really see here, but on the paper we have a map of the sort of average height that birds are flying at. So you can see there's quite a lot of variation in the heights at which they fly. So they don't fly at a uniform height across their range. In terms of the foraging and the commuting, we use various statistical techniques to try and um, basically categorise their behaviours while they're flying based upon the speed at which they're moving between GPS locations and also how much they're sort of turning or the angle between successive locations. So basically commuting is generally considered to be, they're flying pretty fast, pretty straight. And uh, foraging, what you tend to see is um, they slow down, so they're flying slower and you also get sort of turning. It's quite, the gannets are probably one of the seabirds where it's most obvious when you look at the tracks. You will see, if you have, if you have a look at the, the paper maybe, you'll see that they tend to fly in you know, quite straight lines, mm -hmm. spin around for a little bit and then come back. That's kind of a classic <laughs> one. Yeah. Is that is that seems active foraging or is that different again? Well, we, we, I think for this we just had commuting and foraging, so okay. we don't go into any finer details. I mean, there, there probably is if you looked, there's, there's different types of foraging behaviour perhaps. Maybe they, they spin in tighter circles depending upon you know, whether they've seen prey or whether they're really scanning around. But for this it's just those two behaviours, commuting versus foraging. And foraging is the one where we think they reach these higher altitudes so that's probably typically when they're at risk when they're commuting they seem to be around 10 meters on average so that's normally out of the way of the blades so it's when they're foraging they've shown these higher altitudes that puts them at risk yeah so been underestimated before yeah so we don't know necessarily why the boat-based observers have, have, have underestimated flight heights but it seems at least from our stuff it's when they're foraging that they're they're the flying higher than yeah ever seen before right why do you think that is do you they fly higher yeah Oh, I, I can. I guess we have these sort of theories that probably yeah. haven't been tested. But <laughs> one is just you know if they're searching for food, if you're higher up, you can scan more, and so that's either looking for I don't know fish or maybe signs of fish. You could maybe they look at cetaceans, for example, or potentially even looking for other gannets. Because if mm. you see another gannet dive and he's uh, ten kilometres away, so you can go over there. Mm. So it might just be a scanning behaviour initially, and then there is also when they dive, they use the momentum that they generate during the sort of ascent, sorry descent rather. So if you're higher up, you get more momentum, you can get a bit deeper without having to swim. For some of their dives, they just use pure momentum to reach the depth they reach, but sometimes they will actually swim down even further. So the height might be related to just being able to dive down that little bit deeper. Okay, so looking towards the future, what can be done to protect and reduce the impact on these populations, do you think? Yes, yeah, so as I said, I didn't want to be too negative about wind farms, really, but because the birds are flying higher, it makes sense they're going to be more at risk. Um, in terms of what can be done, the first thing is, I think placement is quite important of wind farms. So in an ideal world, to probably place them as much as you can away from uh, seabird colonies. There's a bit of a constraint here because the, the, sea, the sea floor isn't always suitable for wind farms either. So that because only some places you can move them, but ideally you'd move them away. If you can't, like in the Firth of Forth, that's quite close to a lot of seabird colonies, but there are other things you can do. So you could uh, reduce the number of turbines in the farm that's going to reduce the area that the blades cover and that's typically there are some wind farms that have been rejected or they've had they've been changed the designs and they've reduced the number of turbines so that's quite easy to do okay and you can uh, make bigger turbines if it's possible so at the moment the law says the minimum height above sea level they can sleep is 22 meters and we recommended in the paper if you put it up to 30 it gives you an extra sort of eight meter window of safety so it, yeah. it does make a reasonable effect on the number of birds that are predicted to collide and you could and i mean you know, in theory, you could raise it higher and higher. I'm not a wind farm designer, so I don't know <laughs> yeah. if, if there's a, there's a cut-off where it becomes economically pointless to do so. But yeah, if yeah. just uh, maybe less turbines, maybe raise them a okay. bit higher. I think it's worth pointing out that we used a generic wind farm design in the paper because we didn't have the specs of the actual farms being built. So your study estimated that around 1,500 breeding adults could be killed per year at two planned sites. So um, what does this mean on a population level? Should we be worried? I think, yeah, I think regardless of the population consequences, you don't want to be, uh, you know, responsible for the mortality for killing, yeah, of, that, horrible, of that many yeah. birds. Uh, we don't really know much about the demography, to be fair, of Bass Rock. There was a, a previous study that we found that had been done that was a, a population viability analysis, which suggested you could sustainably harvest, in this case, it gives me a knock out of the sky with a turbine, 2,000 adults uh, per year. Mm. And so we're below that, and that's good. Well, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. But that previous estimate was based upon a much smaller population size. It was done a few years ago when the population size, I think, was around forty to 50,000. And actually, the population's been growing, so it's now 75,000. So in, in theory, I don't know, you could, you could, in theory, be able to get away with killing even more. <laughs> and the population should, in theory, 
you know, be sustainable. But it's just you don't really want to be doing that. It's kind no, of risky. Yeah. And also, I suppose you'd have to think about the cumulative impacts That's of it, yeah. both these farms and potentially others. And plus any other effects on their behaviour that we don't know about. Because there is kind of a catch-22 here, which is, I mean, these farms are going to be probably going to be built in some farm anyway. And so you're never, you're never quite certain what the birds are going to do until it's built, unfortunately. Mm. But I think there's an opportunity for people to at least once farms are built is it's you really should kind of have a responsibility to study a lot of the birds and other wildlife in the area for a few years afterwards especially if you've built up good uh, baseline data before a focus on monitoring and management post yeah. turbine yeah. implementation <laughs> yeah because i mean there was a few studies there's like wind turbines in uh, denmark for example where they have done a bit of study afterwards but you know generally it's not always that detailed and you know once you've built it you might as well look into it in more mm. detail because there's still quite a lot of uncertainty about lots of different bits of this um, so for example even avoidance rate how often do birds have actually how actually they actively avoid these turbines is a question that's not really been satisfactorily answered so I mean, if you do build them you might as well do lots of research yeah. afterwards yeah I think that's why your research is really good because it's such broad implications when you are thinking about wind turbines um, where to put them and actually I can see potential for this being researched across all species of birds surely yeah I mean so our stuff is quite gannet focused but we should if you were broad you'd say well actually they are just one of many many different species and there's you know, even little ecosystems that are going to be affected by wind turbines and so you've got to try and manage as well as you can everything together at, at the same time maybe you have to accept that you are going to have some detrimental effects upon the environment because you're going to build a wind farm in it there's no, there's no way around that it's just about alleviating some of them yeah so but there's other other seabirds as well for example a lot of them say things like guillemots etc fly quite low they won't be at risk of colliding but you might be building upon uh, know, sand eel beds so some of their prey species and we don't know whether that's going to be a positive or a negative thing mm -hmm. for example so there's a whole different there's all loads of species with mm -hmm. all different ecologies which will be affected in slightly different ways what's your plans now are you going to continue looking at gannets or so actually I'm, I'm, I'm here working on uh, Brent geese at the moment, so it's a different species, but it, it still uses tracking data, but in a slightly different way, so the link there is that I'm still tracking animals. But uh, this uh, wind farm stuff is kind of ongoing, so I'm kind of involved in it a bit now, but not quite so much, because I did a lot of the analysis, so people ask questions, but there's um, various PhD students, so I know for example there's PhD students working on Baz Rock, basically doing the altimeter stuff, but on a, a much bigger scale. There's some doing it um, at Alta Craig as well, which is another colony on the west coast of Scotland. And there's also people studying it now in a grass zone, which is a Welsh colony. So there's, there's now three colonies where we're going to be estimating these sort of flight heights. So we'll, we'll get a broader picture of what gannets do. Plus, we should be able to you know, improve the, the methods we used to get uh, flight heights. And there's, there's all sorts of cool things that we could do in the future. Like I was looking into um, actually downloading very, like, almost hourly maps of sea level pressure to get get better and better calibrations of this reference to level pressure so that would be a really cool thing to do in the future now that you know how to do it it's fantastic you can start building it more and more ah, well, we're still working on how to do that uh, <laughs> sea level pressure from maps thing it's, it's, it's quite difficult there's lots of lots of data but i think it will be, will be possible so it would be cool and then i guess just assume you know we'll be able to refine this technique as the more and more we use it so we should be getting more and more precise estimates of flight height in the future and then i guess maybe spread to other species yeah just, uh, their main the limitation there is gannets are quite big so they can, they can carry a few loggers whereas okay, other species yeah. a bit smaller maybe can hopefully with the development of technology and yeah if it gets smaller we can do it yeah. and people love to track stuff so exactly <laughs> brilliant well I look forward to it thank you so much for your time Ian really That's appreciate great. it if you have any more questions feel free to contact us and you can find us on Facebook at UOE Natural Selection or on Twitter at UOE Podcast Bye. The Natural Selection.